All right, so if you looked at uh, part six of my lectures on uh, economic life, you'd notice that something got screwed up on the, on the part about horticulture. So I thought I would just uh, talk you through that a little bit and then try to say a little something more about agriculture and then kind of wrap this thing up. So um, if you have your PowerPoints that I had already sent to you, uh, maybe you can follow along, but this is what it would look like here. I can get it in a little closer for you if I can. All right, there you go. Okay, so let's look at these various points. Um, we said that horticulture is a mode of livelihood. It's based on gardening. It's based on small-scale farming with hand tools, basically. That's the way I think about it. It's just that it's farming with hand tools. And then we have two types of horticulture. We've got uh, shifting, something called shifting cultivation. It's also called Swidden, um, and it's also called Slash and Burn horticulture. So all those things, shifting cultivation, Swidden, Slash and Burn horticulture, all mean the same thing. They're all talking about the same thing. I actually prefer the term Slash and Burn because it's, I think, more descriptive of what it actually is. And then we have uh, dry land gardening. So each type of horticulture, uh, each type is distinct from the other according to geogra geography or topography or climate. Um, those things are going to shape the conditions under which people can farm. Um, so an example of a slash and burn horticultural people would be the Yanomamo. Uh, they, this kind of horticulture is practiced by people who live in areas with abundant rainfall. Um, like I said, like the Yanomamo, they do this. The, uh, the Hopi and the Zuni, think about them, the Hopi and the Zuni live in the southwestern part of what is the United States, all right? So it's very dry there. It's almost desert there. They do dry land gardening there. All right, so now how can we describe each type? Well, slash and burn horticulture is where people will move into an area and they will uh, actually burn down um, and clear uh, a, a, a piece of land. And when they do that, uh, it has a couple of consequences. One of the things it does, well, first of all, it's a real easy way to clear the land. And second of all, it is, um, they'll fix certain kinds of nutrients into the soil. And then they will be able to garden. Um, the, uh, the dry land gardening involves a little bit, maybe I would consider it more of a scattershot approach to farming. So dry land gardeners like the Hopi and the Zuni, they tend to have a little more diversity in their, first of all, in the number of, of staple crops that they have. Uh, the Yanomamo are much more reliant on root crops as their a root crop as their uh, staple crop. The uh, the Hopi and the Zuni have uh, corn and beans and squash uh, that they farm, and like I said, they take more of a scattershot approach to farming to gardening. So they try, first of all, to stagger their planting times. And so they'll plant you know, different, kind of in different waves. Uh, and then they also will try to diversify where they are planting. So they're going to search out the best areas, like the places that are maybe a little bit lower, uh, and hold water, hold moisture a little longer. And then they're going to hope to hit rain. And uh, so by by staggering their planting times and, and, and sort of diversifying their locations, uh, they are uh, increasing the chances that they're going to, first of all, hit rain, and second of all, that they're going to uh, get some food. So uh, that's really the difference between the two of them. Um, uh, but hortic excuse me, horticulture, like foraging is essentially a subsistence mode of production, a sub oh boy, hiccups, a subsistence uh, mode of livelihood. And um, it is also basically an extensive strategy. 
It has a division of labor based on gender and age. Uh, and within that division of labor, there's a little bit clearer distinction, a little bit clearer definition of men's and women's work roles as compared to hunting and gathering, as compared to foraging society. So if you remember our chart, it moves us a little bit more from left to right when it comes to, to the division of labor. Uh, for example, in, in uh, horticultural societies, uh, men, like in the Yaramamo society, men clear land, um, both men and women plant, uh, and they both tend to staple crops. Women process food, um, men hunt and fish, and men grow prestige crops. So this idea that men have control over what are called prestige crops. And prestige crops are crops that are used in rituals and feasts. So because of that, because men have control over these prestige crops, uh, they also have a little higher public status than women do in Yanomamo society. Now, there's a place in your chapter, I want to get your book here for a second. There's a place in your chapter where Miller is talking about this. Uh, it's on page, I have, I have this, I have this version of Barbara Miller's book here. And so in that book, if you have that one, it's on page 52. Um, if you don't, it's under where she's talking about horticultural society and where she's describing the division of labor in a horticultural society. So she says, um, in comparing uh, the Yanomamo to the Iroquois, she's looking at the pre- European contact Iroquois uh, in New York, and uh, she says this, right? She says, Iroquois women cultivated maize, the most important food crop, and they controlled its distribution. This control meant that they were able to decide whether the men would go to war, because a war effort depended on the supply of maize to support it. Now, what that's telling us, and I think this is a really, really important lesson, what that's telling us is that um, social status, especially if we're talking about gender status, there's a connection between that. There's a connection between social status, in this case, gender status, and control of resources. So you compare Yanomamo society where men have control over the prestige crops, right? And the men, therefore, have the higher status in society. You compare them to pre-contact Iroquois society where women had control over the most important crop, right, in Iroquois society, which was corn. And because they controlled the production and distribution of corn, they were able to influence very important decisions. So they, had a, they enjoyed a little higher uh, level of status than... Uh, uh, Yanomamo women would have. Okay? So that's all I wanted to really... Well, no, there is a couple of other things, I guess, to say um, about uh, horticultural society. First of all, use rights remain dominant. Okay? So, you know, like foraging society, use rights remain dominant. Um, However, it moves, again, if we go back to that chart, it moves us a little bit further, just incrementally uh, toward exclusionary rights um, uh, because, because people are gardening, because they're, they're, they're gardening these plots of land. Um, it, it means that, that families, right, families can make claims or families can, can put claims on land. Uh, and, and they can also put claims on crops. Um, so in other words, when we get to horticultural society, rules about sharing decline. Um, and so to some extent, we move a little bit away from use rights, although use rights remain very, very important. Um, the other thing I suppose we can say is that, that you know, horticulture has a, has a little bit more 
capacity, a little bit more capability of accumulating surplus or at least storing surplus, but, but very, very, very limited. We're not going to call it a surplus producing society at all. Uh, but we do see with some horticultural societies, the beginnings of uh, surplus production, the beginning of the beginnings of storage. Um, we're not really going to become a surplus producing society till we get to agriculture. And then, um, you know, Miller wants to talk about ecological impact. And so certainly uh, horticultural society is, remains a very sustainable uh, system, a very ecologically sustainable system. But it does, uh, again, move us along the line from sustainable toward unsustainability. Uh, in a very limited way because we're working land now and, and we now have the process of overcropping. And if we overcrop too much, then uh, we, can, we might um, uh, deplete the land, deplete the soil of its nutrients, uh, maybe create the conditions under which soil would erode, uh, and that could permanently damage soil. So um, not as light, not as light a footprint. Right, as a hunting and gathering society, okay? Um, now, we also had talked about, I ended that last section by talking about agriculture. And so I wanted to just uh, get, get to my slide on agriculture. And I think I got through uh, talking about female farming systems. So when we were describing agricultural society, we said, well, now this is a full-blown surplus producing society. Um, it, it brings us specialization in the division of labor, all that stuff. I think we went through that. And I, you know, I was explaining or we talked about and Miller talks about what a peasant system is, what a peasant society is. And then she also talks about female farming systems. I think I got into female farming systems a little bit for you. Uh, if I didn't, you want to make sure you read in your book about what a female farming system is. Um, and, and then uh, she also talks about industrial farming. So you may want to look at that part too in your book. What, it, what does she mean by industrial farming? Uh, industrial agriculture. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, I think we also said that, that you know, in this society, we, we have now uh, a full-blown system of exclusionary property rights. We have the idea of private property and all that stuff. And I guess the, you know, the last thing we would say is about agriculture is that ecologically, um, we have moved from being an extensive to an intensive system. Right, so it's a agriculture is an intensive uh, has an intensive strategy. Uh, so that means that we have the, a great possibility, right, for all kinds of ecological damage. Um, when she describes when she describes agriculture as intensive an intensive strategy or is involving an intensive strategy, she says. Intensification involves the use of techniques that allow the same plot of land to be used repeatedly without losing its fertility. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, overworking land. Now we have this the, the problem of, of possibly overworking land uh, and, and causing erosion and causing soil depletion uh, and so on. And, I mean, maybe you remember from... Um, you remember from Jared Diamond's uh, little film there where you had the guy that, who was commenting on the landscape and he said, you look out at this bare landscape and this is the con really the consequence of over farming. Uh, and, um, you know, it, almost in the way that we had the Dust Bowl, you know, in the 1930s in the United States because of the overworking of the land and the improper, improper use of farming techniques and so forth. But, you know, even with agricultural systems, you're going to get some, some agricultural systems that are going to be rainfall dependent and other agricultural systems that are going to be irrigation dependent. And they both bring with them uh, possibilities of ecological damage. One, you know, overworking the land is always a big one. But when we start irrigating uh, land as well, uh, we're, we're stressing 
uh, water supplies and, and so forth, and, and opening the possibility of polluting the soil uh, and so on. So that's about all I have right now on, uh, on agriculture. So we've got one more little part to do uh, in our discussion of economic life. And uh, for that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about globalization and colonialism. Okay? So we'll see you in a little bit.